Courage is armor a blind man wears. That calloused scar of outlived despairs. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. Good morning, Living Church. It's great to see you here today. I want to talk about uh, myself just for a moment to give you an update on uh, my trajectory. I am well known as an utter failure at retirement. (laughs) But I'm going to try something new in the coming days. I brought a proposal to our leadership, and uh, they have accepted that, that uh, I'm going to be going to, I am currently in a half-time position. Uh, That doesn't mean the message is half as long today, Uh, but they have agreed to that, and uh, so I'm not retiring, I'm recalibrating. And there are many things that I feel God has still called me to do. I feel like Caleb, who said at the end of his life, give me this mountain, and there are a lot of challenges that I am still very energized by. I will be doing the things I love most about pastoring, I'll be... uh, mentoring and coaching men. I'll be teaching ironworks and in teaching in other places, occasionally preaching when I'm needed. And I hope to be generating some resources both digitally and in print uh, by doing some writing. So there's plenty that I'm challenged with and uh, I'm looking forward to that. But it has been a great privilege for me uh, this last three and a half years. It's not been a problem at all. It's been a privilege for me. It's been great to walk through the, the challenges that we've faced as a church and to see how God has worked. And uh, I have really felt that it's been a calling on my life. It's been very rewarding to, to do that. And uh, so this is a, a recalibration of my life. They're, they're kind of putting me in a, a halfway house to see if I can detox from full-time ministry uh, with an ankle bracelet to make sure I don't wander too far. Uh, actually, that's my wife is putting that on me, but... Uh, so that's what's happening with me, and then, so I'll still be around. You won't see me as frequently, but I'm, I'll still be engaged in ministry. Well, we're involved in a series that Pastor Devin began on the life of Elijah, kind of a, a high flyover of his life, and today we come to a scene in his life that the Lord has preserved in his word, and we come to a place called Jezreel, which is north of Jerusalem. It's a valley. It's a very fertile valley where there's lots of agriculture, and we're going to meet a man named Naboth who is confronted by his king named Ahab. And God has preserved this story for us, for our instruction. So if you're able to stand as we read the word of God, would you stand with me as we read this story out of 1 Kings chapter 21. <clears throat> now Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near my house and I will give you a better vineyard for it or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I would give you the inheritance of my fathers. And Ahab went into his house vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food, you whiner? That's an editorial comment. And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if, if you please, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered me, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters to ah- in Ahab's name and se- sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and to the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. 
And she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him and let them bring a charge against him saying, you have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of his city, the elders and the leaders who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them. Now, God has preserved this story for our instruction. You may be seated. This is the word of God. Okay, so you want to be a prophet. You feel like the church should be more prophetic. It should speak the word more piercingly, more clearly, more relevantly to our world. So you want to emulate the courage of Elijah. Well, here's just one example of the prophet being called into a brutal, lawless, ungodly place to speak the truth of God. Now, some of you will remember the name Pablo Escobar, a well-known late, now, drug king. He began the Medellin drug cartel in Colombia. And as he began that and as he made billions of dollars and shipped cash in pallet loads, he became the ruthless ruler, basically, of Colombia. He killed policemen. He had judges killed. He abducted people. He tortured people. He ran the economy. He ran the legal courts. He, he ran the, the whole country from his mountaintop fortress that was impregnable. So here's Pablo Escobar, who literally is the potentate of Colombia. And imagine you're a CIA agent, and you're told to go to Pablo Escobar unarmed and say to him, buddy, this all is coming down. You would literally be taking your life in your hands. Well, that's a little bit like what Elijah is called to do. We read it in the pages of Scripture, and it comes to us in three or four verses, but we forget the danger and the threat because the most often quoted phrase about a prophet is, kill the messenger. Don't regard the message, just, just kill the messenger. And so here we have this occasion where Elijah goes in. It seems like he's consistently called from obscurity into the national spotlight. He's from Tishbe. Nobody knows where that really is. And, and the first thing we hear about him, he's coming to the king and saying, hey, there's going to be three and a half years of drought. And the king knows him as the troubler of Israel. And then he does some more obscure things. He, he uh, uh, was fed by ravens in the wild. He uh, lives on a widow's grain and oil, and he raises her son from the dead. And, and then he's called out to the uh, Mount Carmel where he confronts the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets, and fire comes down and consumes the, the offering and all of those prophets. And then he runs away and he falls into a deep depression and he's fed by ravens by God in this dark place. God leads him on a 40-day journey to Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai. He's refreshed. He hears the word of God there. He comes back and later he pronounces some dire pro prophecies over Ahab, Ahab's sons, and the next king named Ahaziah. Well, this is the life and ministry of Elijah. And he's presiding over this time, and now he comes into this scene that I've read for you, and here's how it continues in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who's in Samaria, Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. And Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. So you want to be a prophet. So you want to be a prophetic word. You want to be a church that speaks the truth. You know, prophets didn't primarily major in prediction. What they majored in was warning. What they majored in was correction and teaching and recalling the people 
And this is exactly what Elijah is doing here. But when you go to speak that word, you'll be about as welcome as the CIA in Medellin. It's going to be very threatening to do that. And I believe we are a living remnant today. That the, those who believe in the truth of Scripture, those who follow Jesus Christ, are not a sociological or economic or cognitive majority, but in fact we are a shrinking minority in our culture. That we're a living remnant. And that doesn't mean we're going to go off and hide. It doesn't mean we're going to get into a bunker. But what it means is we need to be ready. And we also need to stand fast and hold forth the truth and be that prophetic word to our culture that needs to be there, no matter what it costs. And Elijah leaves us a legacy of this kind of courage. And yet in James chapter 5, it says he was just a man, just like the rest of us. He was just a person, a man or a woman who had the Spirit of God on him, and he was weak in himself, but he shows us how an ordinary man or woman can stand with prophetic courage in a corrupt age. And so here we see him again speaking truth to power. But he, he's not done yet. Just to kind of give you an overview of the rest of the story about Elijah, he comes along later and he meets Elisha. And he puts the mantle of prophecy on him. Uh, he, he walks across the Jordan on dry land as one of the miracles that happens in his life. And then he's called up in chariots of fire and whirlwind. If you hear the... the the strains of Vangelis playing in the movie, The Chariots of Fire. That's what it's named after. He, Elijah didn't die. He had his own personal rapture. Wouldn't, th wouldn't that be great? Yeah, practice on me, Lord. I'll go right now. Elijah didn't die. But there's more about Elijah because he also appears in the New Testament several times. John the Baptist comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah. At the transfiguration of Jesus, there's Moses and Elijah. There's strong evidence as we look at the book of Revelation in chapter 11 that there are two witnesses in, that, in the tribulation period, and one is Moses and the other one is Elijah. And so the spirit and power of Elijah comes into the New Testament, and I want to deliver to you what I think is the challenge of Elijah's life coming into our world today, into our life today. And it comes to us in the very last words of the Old Testament, where Elijah is mentioned once again. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. To turn the hearts of the fathers toward the children is the spirit and the power of Elijah. But this is not a, a, a verse about parenting, although it could be a, long, you know, a, a distant application of that. No, this is talking about the fathers of the nation, the, the mature of the nation, the the mothers and fathers, the guardians, those who have the repository of truth in their lives, those who know the grace and mercy and, and authority of God, that the fathers are to turn their hearts to the next generation and teach the vulnerable, teach those who don't have it, teach those who are at risk of not knowing the truth, that the hearts of the mature need to turn toward those who desperately need the truth, and that is the spirit and power of Elijah in our day. Because the Holy Spirit has come upon us, and he lives in us, and gives us this kind of power. So how do we go about that? Well, as I've been incubating on the life of Elijah, I've noticed that a lot of his ministry happened because he was willing to ask hard questions. So I'm going to give you three of his hard questions that he asks, and I want to ask us if we are willing to ask those questions ourselves, of those we love, of those we oppose, of those who are in our culture. And the first question is this, how long will you go on limping between two 
opinions? That's the question he asks in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. We're at the, the Mount Carmel, and he's confronting the priests of Baal. And here's what it says. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. If we're going to have courage in this culture, courage calls for a commitment. We're going to have to ask the question. We're going to have to, to pierce the darkness, either of an ideology or of a friend's life or a child's life, a family member's life, and ask the question, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? At some point, everyone we love Every ideology, every philosopher, every theologian, every politician is going to have to ask, answer the question, whom do you follow? And we're to ask this question, how long will you limping after all these other opinions? And we as believers think that we have a very sweet invitation. It's an invitation of grace and forgiveness and a whole new life and being reborn and, and for us, it seems so winsome to ask that question, come to the opinion that God has and believe in that. But when you do that, you are claiming something that is absolutely noxious to our culture. You are claiming to know the truth. You're claiming that you know that this is true and this is only opinion. And the most important question in life is, whom do you serve? God is constantly asking us, do you still follow me? And we need to ask of our friends, our neighbors, our family members, whom do you serve? Doesn't this sound like Joshua? Who said, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It sounds like Jesus. He who is not with me is against me. It sounds like 2 Timothy 2.5. There is one God. And one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And in Acts chapter 5, the apostle said, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name written under heaven whereby we must be saved. We need to ask the question, are you still sitting on the fence? Or do you see the truth, willing to believe the truth? And this flies in the face of the viral relativism of our culture. Now, you know what relativism is? It's, it's not the virus that you get at the family reunion from your relatives. Relativism means that everything is floating. Everything is relative to everything else. There are no absolutes. There are no moral absolutes. There are no boundaries. There's no objective truth. It's all relative. We are now hearing it mentioned almost every day in our media that every boundary, every morality, every history, every fact, every law, everything of biology is a social construct. It's made up. And we can keep making up more as we evolve, these are called arbitrary absolutes and floating anger, anchors. I call this sovereign opinion. It's my sovereign opinion. It's the cult of me. And you cannot pierce that. And we need to recognize today when we're asking the question, how long will you limp between all of these opinions that if we say we know the truth, we will be hated for that. We'll be labeled bigoted and hateful. You will be punished for the slightest challenge of someone's personal autonomy and their lived experience. And I'm not saying those aren't important on a smaller level, but they are certainly not something to run your life by. In Romans chapter 1, it describes what's happening and what has happened in our world. In verse 21, 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. You see, religion is not the fruit of a fervent pursuit of God. Religion is all about the passion to avoid the authority of God and the holiness of God over our lives. And this is exactly what happens in all idolatry and all idol idols it demand the same thing from us and that is absolute obedience. And there are ultimately only two sides here. There's the, the side of God and the side of not God. And so at the right time, in the right conversation, you have the courage to ask the question. And maybe it would come in something like this. My friend, do you see the utter impossibility of a random chance universe? Are you willing to entertain the fact that it had to come from someplace and someone? Or maybe it's the question, have you thought about what happens when you die? Is it just over? Is there nothing? Maybe it would come in the question of what is the purpose of life anyway? And is your current lifestyle filling up the gaps in your soul? Are you really finding satisfaction for the hunger that you feel? Maybe it would be a question that says, is there ever going to be any justice for the brutality of this world? For the heinous crimes that have been done? Is there any higher authority where we will be judged? And if, if there is, how will we meet that authority? Are you ready to trust the one who made it? Are you ready to see the creator who loves you? And Jesus was as radical as anyone to say no to all the idols of the world. And therefore, in the spirit and the wisdom and the power of Elijah, here's what Romans 10 gives us as an assignment. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And that's us. That's the living church. That's the Elijah spirit and power who are being called and is called the gospel. And the gospel is beautiful. The gospel is simple. But by its very simplicity and clarity, it is hated today. But a faithful remnant recognizes that we are as much in an idol cult today as ever was in ancient Israel. And the book of 1 John says, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So many Antichrists have already come. And what is the essence of the Antichrist? It says that Jesus is not the Son of God. So the first question to ask is, how long will you limp between these opinions? And courage calls for a commitment. Are you willing to ask that of yourself and of those you love? There's a second question that comes up, and we read about this one in 1 Kings chapter 21. <clears throat> and that's the question, have you, have you killed and also taken possession? I, I've been uh, reading a series of, of adventure books uh, written by a guy named C.J. Box. And uh, it's about a, a, a Wyoming game warden called Joe Pickett. And uh, I'm kind of addicted to these now. I have a supplier who keeps me addicted to them. And Joe Pickett is this straight-laced, you know, by-the-book uh, game warden. And then he solves all these mysteries. But but often he'll, he'll hear of somebody who's a, a poacher or whatever, and he'll go to the cabin door, knock on the door, and he has this mechanism he uses. He'll knock on the door, the person will open the door, and he'll stand there and he'll just say, you probably know why I'm here. 
And he gets all kinds of confessions out of people just by standing there assuming that their conscience will, will convict them of something. Well, that's basically what Elijah is doing in this situation. Here's what it says in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 19. And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Elijah is called into this heinous and brutal, despicable injustice that's been done. An innocent man has been falsely accused and stoned in public so that his vineyard could be stolen from him. And Ahab is standing there caught in the act. And so Elijah asked this rhetorical question, which basically is saying, did you murder innocents in order to get what you want? Did you murder innocents? Did you slaughter that which was not guilty for the sake of getting what you want right now? Did you use your power, your greed, your lies, your selfishness to enhance your own lifestyle? And here's the kind of courage that we need. Courage confronts the morality of the day. Do I have the courage to ask this kind of question? Have you killed and also taken possession? In the book of the letter of 2 Timothy, we get a description of what people will be like in the last days. And here's what it says. Listen to this description, 2 Timothy chapter 3. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. What a description of our current culture. And there's one word out of that that just pops out for me that's kind of a, a holistic summary of all of them, and it's this word, unappeasable. In other words, this cult is never satisfied. It cannot be placated. It's unappeasable. It makes this rule, and then it changes it tomorrow. And it makes this agreement, and then it walks away from that agreement. It moves the goalposts all the time. It's unappeasable. You don't know how you can appease the demands of the idle cult in which we live. And like the wicked kings of Israel, they never had, the northern tribes of Israel never had a righteous king for a couple of hundred years. They never had a righteous king. And all those wicked kings dedicated the high places and tried to ingratiate themselves to the idols of their culture by sacrificing their sons in the fire of Molech. And I believe that we, the living remnant, are living in a cult of death. When you look at abortion, increasing euthanasia, the gender-blocking drugs and surgeries that are being recommended for preteens, when you think about the extreme thrill sports where people take their lives in their hands to get themselves on YouTube, this one will get me in trouble. When you think about pet worship or the anti-child culture of the Western world. It's a cult of self. It's a cult of, of killing or obliterating or denying something that would last generations for the sake of current pleasures and comforts. It's a cult of death. Slaughtering innocence to get what we want. There's a young man who's uh, only 23 years old. His name is David Hogg. He, 
he got some fame because of the Parkland mass school shooting about five years ago. And uh, he became a, an advocate uh, in many ways for gun control and some other things, but he's, he's got a certain degree of, of, of fame on Twitter. He wrote recently these words, quote, Pets are the affordable version of kids today. I'm never planning on having kids. I would much rather own a Porsche and a Portuguese water dog and a golden doodle. Long term, it's cheaper. It's better for the environment. And will never tell you that it hates you or ask you to pay for college. Now, he's saying overtly, what many are living. And it's not just about children. It's about killing something that is valuable for the sake of something immediate. And this question, have you killed and also taken possession? You should never have crossed that line. And do I have the courage to ask with grace and with truth at the right time in the conversation? Have you killed new life or future life, so that you can possess some kind of phantom freedom that you crave today? Are you willing to sacrifice your purity for pleasure? Are you going to give up fellowship for the sake of your career? Have you gotten what you wanted, but at what cost to your soul? And what is the next generation learning? from those of us who ought to be guarding the future. The hearts of the fathers, the hearts of the mothers, the hearts of the mature, the hearts of Elijah need to come to the next generation because our our world is literally killing and snuffing out the next generations. And it may not end with dogs licking the blood like in Ahab's life, but it will certainly end with deep heartache and regret. But don't think that this message will be easily received because any stepping across the line of the current idolatry will bring immediate retribution. There was a student in high school, a senior in high school in Idaho, who was called to give, uh, share some wisdom with underclassmen. So... Here's a senior in high school offering all his wisdom to younger people. But actually, Travis Lohr, in his unprepared marks, remarks, said this, Guys are guys and girls are girls. There is no in-between. Here's how the news reported that. Despite the fact that this simple statement has been a truism for all human history, the leadership of Kellogg High School seemed to think it was unacceptable The principal informed Travis Lohr that he would not be allowed to walk in his graduation ceremony on Saturday. And then when he reported to his summer job the next day, they told him he had been fired. When you dare to cross the line of this culture, when you dare to ask a question about the reality of what's happening, be prepared. Be prepared. You will not be well received. Speaking the truth, asking an honest question is revolutionary and dangerous in a world full of lies. So you want to be a prophet. Can we ask these questions? How long will you go on limping after these opinions? Have you killed and also taken possession? And a third question is this one. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you inquire it to inquire of his word we find this in second kings chapter one we're now looking at another king his name is ahaziah and ahaziah has had a physical accident he's fallen he's hurt he's seriously injured and he, he's desperate for relief and so he tells his his leadership there go and inquire of Baalzebub the god of Ekron, he apparently hasn't learned from history that that's not a good idea. And three times in chapter 1 of 2 Kings, 
it asks this question. Here's what it says in verse 16. And he said to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Here's the question. Is there no God in Israel to inquire of his word? It, it's interesting that this is a health care issue. <laughs> this is a personal issue. This is a quality of life question. He, he's worried and, and afraid, and he's desperate for an answer. He wants a way to find a healing and safety and protection in his life. And, and where are you willing to search for that? And the question is, will you come to the true source of truth, which is the word of God? Will you come to that place where you have an anchor? You've built your house on a rock. You are solidly committed to the one Lord of glory, no matter what the storm is in your life. I think it was about 1961. A lot of you in this room were not around at that time. And I was in fifth or sixth grade. And this was a time of, of, of uh, nuclear uh, buildup in the world between Russia and the United States. And they called it mutually assured destruction. You fired us, we're going to fire back, and it'll be so much destruction that it held everybody at bay. But we were told under great authority that we would be protected from a nuclear blast if we would crawl under our school desks <laughs> and hunker down. So we heard about nuclear warfare in our schools, and we had drills about that. So I was at camp, and I was about fifth or sixth grade, and, and we had this revivalist kind of preacher, and he was up there preaching about uh, good stuff, I'm sure, but he, then some jets flew over, and he stopped, and he said, that could be the Russians right now, and scared us to death, you know, and, and a lot of us went down for rededication at the end of that <laughs> message, but the question he asked us was, if, if, if an atheist came, if a Russian came and held a gun to your head and said, you must deny Jesus, would you stand? Would you deny him, or would you say, I cannot deny him, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go? And, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to hope that if it was that simple, that difficult, but that simple a choice, if somebody said, you're going to die now or deny Jesus, that I would say, well, let me go to heaven. I'm, I'm ready. But what if it isn't that sudden? What if it's more gradual? What if it's the walls closing in on our American freedoms? What if it's the boa constrictor pressure of health or family or politics or career or food chain or something like that? What if it's something that's not quite that stark? What if they came to you and said, you're not allowed to adopt children in this culture unless you agree in advance to celebrate that child's gender choice on into their adulthood? Because that's happening. What if they wrote you up because you wouldn't wear a pride flag or some other flag in the parade? What if you lose your job because somewhere along the line you defended traditional marriage? What if your child was rejected from college because they did a search and found out what kind of church they attended? What if they started taxing your giving? Or slandered you to the HR office. Or sued you because you wouldn't build a website for them. What, what if the vice slowly closes on us? Where do we go for help? Do we go to the word of God and find our anchor there? Or do we, or do we fidget? Do we, do we try to escape? Do we... Are we willing to compromise our integrity because we want something that we don't want to let go of? I think this is the kind of pressure that we may be facing in the very near future. It may not be military. It might not be direct politics. It may just be the strangulation 
of bureaucratic rules and policies. And the question is going to be, not only how do I navigate that, but how do I do it with truth and grace? And will the Word of God give me encouragement even when I'm having to give up some things that I thought would always be mine? What will you resort to? In Matthew 24, Jesus is asked about the end of the age and what will the signs be. And one of the most gripping things he says that in those days when the trouble comes, many will fall away. That they will betray and hate one another inside the elect. And the chilling phrase is that the love of many will grow cold. And this is what happens when we're afraid to ask the question, is there no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Will you inquire of his word? And this is coming right inside the evangelical church. It's called the progressive church. Let me give you five characteristics briefly of what's happening right inside many churches. Number one is this, is a diminished view of Scripture. That the Word is not taken as the Word of God. It's something that contains the Word of God. And it's got a lot of good ideas. But actually, I disagree with Paul on that. Or, or Jesus never experienced this. And so he was unaware of how, how we need to live our life today. You know, the Word of God is, is it contains the truth, but it's not everything. The second aspect of this is that emotions matter more than the truth. And this happens, this is happening all over. Some of you know this in your own families. You believe the truth, but someone in your family or a friend is living a, an alternative lifestyle. And because you want to retain that relationship, you are willing to abandon truth to embrace something that's immoral. Emotions matter more than truth. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't love. We ought to love. We need to find ways to love expensively. But do we abandon truth for the sake of emotion? The third thing is that essential doctrines are viewed as pliable convictions. That, oh, well, the resurrection, it actually didn't have to happen. It's just sort of metaphorical. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not that it actually needed to happen. It's just what we believe about it, those types of things. The fourth thing is that clear terms are redefined, like sin, or hell, or judge, judgment, or immorality. And the fifth characteristic of progressive churches is that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, becomes a secondary endeavor. That we ought to all be about feeding the poor, and loving people, and accepting them, and justice, and equity, and equality, and all of those are good things. But the ransom of slaves from the slave market of sin and the rescue of dying people to eternal life, the gospel becomes secondary. Is there no word of God in Israel? Where will we seek our comfort? Courage consults the word, not the culture. Now, the Word's not going to give you an MRI. The Word's not going to teach you how to do better on your SAT. It won't fix your car or tell you what hot water heater to buy. But it gives you an anchor for your soul. And it gives you a compass and a sail through the storm. And that's exactly why we trust the Scripture, that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is why we call ourselves Bereans. We want to come back to the Word of God and see if that's what it actually says to us. I just want to conclude with this exhortation from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That's the spirit 
and the power of Elijah. And that's why these next two verses are so important. They're often so glibly quoted. But the living remnant of Jesus Christ needs these verses. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Courage calls for a commitment. Courage in our day is willing to confront the morality of our day. And courage consults the word of God. This is the spirit and the power of Elijah that lives on in the living church. And may it be so among us. Let's pray together. Father, we are so desperately in need of you. And I often think, Lord, about myself and when the hour comes or the many, many pressures to cave, to slip away, to rationalize, Lord, I pray that you will help me to stand. I pray for everyone in the sound of this message today, Lord, help us to stand. We're just human. We want to be like Elijah, be filled with the spirit and power that filled him by the spirit of God today. Be that faithful remnant that represents you and joyfully gathers together to encourage one another because the days are short. And the pressure is great, but you are greater than all of these. And we love you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.